Where do you reckon the future of the various operating systems are heading? Will they be more integrated and seamless? Do you foresee a greater adoption of GNU Linux desktop in the future? Will it all be a dumpster fire? That's a good question that's sent in from at Funkdoid over on Twitter. If you want to send in questions like this, you just use the hashtag AskLonDuke and, 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 I'll, and I'll see when I go through them. Uh, so this is a question. Basically, what you're asking me, if I'm reading between the lines here, is is the future of all the various operating systems simply going to be a giant dumpster fire? The answer is... Maybe. So here's what I foresee. If uh, I'm going to take a step back and, and look at how operating system design and development has changed over the last 20 or 30 years and try and from that extrapolate out what things might do over the next 20 years. And it's kind of hard to do because there have been some really fundamental shifts in operating system design over the last couple of decades. At the same time, there have been some big areas of stagnation, which may not remain stagnant. So, one, going forward, do I see more adoption of Linux, of free software and open source on desktop environments. Yes, absolutely. I see that. That is just, I think, a given at this point. And it, it, it's not for technical reasons. The technical reasons are there. But the reason I think that there's going to be greater adoption is just simply going to be cost. Uh, it's it's just like why, why did Google adopt Linux to power both Android and Chrome OS? Money. It's just, it, it's an existing system with a huge amount of the developers already working on it, a massive amount of documentation, huge, huge amounts of training that have already been done. So they have a talent pool to pull from and a system in place for allowing them to utilize the work of various other companies and of the community at large to further their own interests. It is just logical from a financial and project management perspective to lean on that, to take advantage of that. Otherwise, they're going to be reinventing the wheel a whole bunch. And even if they thought that the Linux wheel was not the best wheel, that they could make a better wheel, there's still a fundamental problem in that it, that new wheel is going to cost a whole lot of money, a whole lot. Uh, if you look at <clears throat> the amount of money and man hours and lines of code that have been put into the Linux kernel itself, not even bringing into consideration the GNU compiler chains and Emacs and various uh, various other user land applications on that sit on top of it. Just the kernel. It is huge. It is massive. It is thousands and thousands of developers working for decades at this point like two and a half decades that's massive no company wants to replicate that uh you're just not going to want to now some companies already have a big investment in a kernel architecture and user land set of applications that may make it so switching it becomes painful but as time goes on and they invariably are going to be looking to and i'm thinking of you know you know apple and microsoft primarily but as they're looking to get rid of code debt, right, the, the, the built up code that they've acquired over years and decades that is just causing their code base to become bloated, difficult to maintain and difficult to improve upon going forward, they're going to be looking to alternatives that save them money and still get them from point A to point B and point B being the destination they want to be at, like for performance or features of the operating system they want to ship faster and cheaper. And if Linux is sitting out there and they can just tap it and say, yeah, let's go with that, they're gonna. And it's not it's not just Linux that's out there. I mean, there's multiple BSD-ish kernels that are out there. Honestly, Truly, honestly, if you're one of these various companies and you're looking around at multiple other options besides Linux, you're going to be looking at things like Haiku as well. Just lots of operating systems that are established that have functioning kernels, that have functioning developer bases to pull from, to hire, to utilize, and, and base an operating system on, and that lets you get to market much, much quicker. Linux is the obvious choice because of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are working on it every single day. You can just easily tap those people and go. You're not going to have a hard time finding Linux engineers. Um, so I see that 
increasing in the future. And regardless of what form that takes in in terms of what's actually shipped, like, for example, um, Android comes out and is Android a Linux desktop? No, and no, it's really not. It's it's more of a Java application layer plus, uh, you know, user interface thing that sits on top of Linux. But but it still means that there's a continued increased investment into Linux, which improves Linux on the desktop as well. Uh, same with Chrome OS, right? Is Chrome OS really a Linux desktop? Well, nowadays it's actually becoming more of a Linux desktop. At first, it was just a web browser using the Linux kernel. And yeah, there was plenty of Linuxy things under the hood, but it kind of hit them and it made them, uh, it made them kind of hard to work with. And uh, there were workarounds, and you could kind of get things going with like things like Crouton and whatnot. You could you could get other Linux applications up and going, but it was kind of a pain. And nowadays. Google's decided they wanted to make that easier, right? Um, and so Chrome OS is becoming more of an actual Linux desktop where you can run LibreOffice, right? Or Firefox. You can put friggin' Linux version of Firefox right there on Chrome OS nowadays. It totally works. Uh, it doesn't have sound support, which is another issue. Uh, but it totally works. So that I don't see that as slowing down. I mean, there's clearly projects within <clears throat> within Google and other companies to create new kernels and create new operating systems like Fuchsia over at Google um, that could in theory replace Linux. But if you're really looking at this honestly, if you're a project manager or a general manager or a VP of technology, if you're someone in that managerial chain making the decisions about what technology to base things on, one of the biggest things you're going to be doing is looking at cost of development, uh, ramp up time for new coders and new testers, um, and what's the available pool of talent really look like. And if you're Google and you're creating, let's say, a new operating system called Fuchsia, a new kernel called Fuchsia with an operating system that goes with it, uh, ultimately, that might prove interesting for some cases. But in the end, it's going to be a much easier financial and logistical course to just simply adopt Linux all the way across the board. Uh, it just simply is. It makes better sense from a managerial point of view. And so I see that continuing. Um, I think there will be a point where Apple and Microsoft will ship a consumer-oriented system that utilizes Linux. I, I Just simply from a project management perspective, it makes sense, at least right now. If I'm looking forward over the next couple of years, it just makes sense. Apple has had to shift gears a couple of times. And so Apple had their classic Mac line that, that really ended with Mac OS 9.x. And then they shift over to Mac OS 10. Now, Mac OS 10 and App Mac OS 9.x are two totally different beasts. And that was a huge jump. And we're already seeing that Mac OS 10 has some problems, right? It, it doesn't have some some performance goodies that, that could really use to be there. Um, it has issues from the management perspective, because there's just not as many kernel engineers and operating system engineers that are going to be working actively on, you know, mock and everything else that that uh, Mac OS 10 uses, they're going to be used to working on Linux. So if Apple wants to take advantage of those people in the market and they want to have the quickest on ramp and the and the lowest uh, amount that they'd be having to pay over over any given time to keep things current to, to do bug fixes and add new drivers and whatnot to to their kernel and to their system, they're going to eventually want to be moving away from their in house work. And moving more towards a system that's not just open source, but open source and shared by everyone else. It's 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 logical. It's just truly logical because I mean, if you look at if you look at the numbers uh, for performance between say Mac OS X and Linux, um, there's a little bit of difference, and there's a couple of areas where one wins and the other loses, but it's not a huge difference. And if Apple could really focus their efforts on fixing that up for themselves and making sure that the drivers for their hardware were really top notch and some of the best performant drivers that are existing, I think Apple would have a very compelling reason to migrate over to a Linux kernel.
And the same is true with Microsoft. Microsoft already ships Linux distributions uh, like Sphere OS for, for Azure. However, they don't ship a commercial Linux distribution. And I, I don't know that Microsoft would ever ship what we, we would consider to be a commercial Linux distribution. I think it would be more likely to take what the form of like what Android created, where they ship a system that is Linux, but on top of it is a series of compatibility layers that creates uh, their own operating system. If you take uh, Wine and Proton and all the work that Steam has been doing, and put them on top of Linux and put a, a desktop environment and window manager on top of that that mimics, let's say, uh, you know, current uh, Windows 10 user interface, which would be very simple to pull off technically. It would be very difficult for the average user to differentiate between Windows 10 and this Windows 10-ified Linux based operating system. So I think there will come a point where Microsoft will probably just slipstream in the kernel, uh, but probably and then build in a couple of, of user land applications and things like uh, wine and whatnot on top of that, and then build a whole bunch of proprietary softwares that ship on top of that, or at least software that has, you know, uh, some closed bits and some open bits. I think that's that's a highly likely thing to see in the coming five to 10 years as they look to get rid of some of that legacy cruft, that code that they've been pulling along with them for so long. Apple's been trying tried to do that multiple times before shipping Mac OS X. There was a project called Copeland. Oh, back at Apple... Um, when they were looking at uh, replacing the existing Mac system, like Macintosh System 7, 7.6.1 or whatever version it was they were looking at at the time. They wanted one that was better at multitasking, that was more crash proof, that had more object oriented features on the desktop. And they wanted to create this new system. They called it Copeland and uh, Copeland. Well, all right, I just oversimplified this to a ridiculous degree. A bunch of computer historians are just like, ah, 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 Lenduk. Ah, okay. Simplified version. They tried to do it <laughs> using a couple of projects. One of them was named Copeland. Uh, and they eventually scrapped that, took a bunch of the features that were going to be in that, uh, and 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 started building out things like uh, you know, Mac OS 10, Mac OS 8 and 8.5 and 8.6 and all that sort of thing, which was a much more beefy classic Mac experience that sort of bridged the gap until Mac OS 10 came around. Uh, anyway, they, they kept trying to do that sort of thing to try and get rid of the, the legacy junk that they've been hauling around for years, if not decades. And now that we're in a spot where emulation of the various platforms is becoming highly performant, not switching your kernel out for Linux is becoming a harder stance to take. It's becoming a more difficult proposition internally if i'm a manager and someone comes to me with a plan that's like let's swap out the nt kernel for linux and here's the compatibility layers we use and here's the initial investment for getting 98 percent of all the games and applications up and running um and then we never really have to worry about kernel work again which we'll is we just hire like a small handful of kernel developers to work on you know the things that are really important to us and and work with the rest of the kernel community but you know most of the rest of the work is handed off to employees at intel and samsung and red hat and Sousa and can everywhere else right oh man that is an enticing proposition it really is i i know a lot of companies have problems with a the not invented here sort of ideology like they, they don't want to use technology that they didn't create themselves i, I understand how that happens and when we're looking at microsoft we're thinking that could be one of the big ones just the same uh, i think i think it makes a lot of sense so yes Will it be a dumpster fire? Long story short, absolutely. We are in store for a glorious dumpster fire. However, if you have the right kind of dumpster fire, you throw in some fireworks in there, like some big, you know, rockets that psh, boom, and all that sort of thing, and you really go nuts, that can be a really fun to watch dumpster fire. And the end result is that it might be visible from space if it's quite big enough. And I think that's where we're headed. And yeah, I see more Linux on the desktop, both 
in the currently recognizable form and in entirely new ways that we may or may not like, but I still think it's coming. Uh, this episode of The Lunduke Show is brought to you in part by Pogo Linux. You can go to pogolinux.com. You can buy servers. You can buy workstations. Oh, you can only see a little bit of it right here. Where is it? I'll touch it with my hand. There it is. <laughs> this is the Tempest. The entire show is running off of this machine right now. Water cooled, whisper quiet. It's a beautiful, beautiful rig. Uh, it's, I've got mine specced out with like nice little i9 and everything. If you go to pogolinux.com, you don't go there because you're like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy myself a cheap two hundred dollar little desktop from e machines at Walmart or something. No, you go to pogolinux.com because you want the best hardware that you know has been tested and ready to rock and roll with possibly multiple Linux distributions. You can get these and you can select, I want to run this with Red Hat Enterprise, Ubuntu, Debian, all sorts of stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, you can even spec out a version of my machine back there over on pogolinux.com, minus the cool artwork on the outside. I just bumped the camera. Um, go over to pogolinux.com and check it out. It's absolutely glorious. And if you want to meet some of the Pogo Linux guys and gals, head on up to Linux Fest Northwest in uh, two weeks. April 26th, 7th, 8th, maybe all three. Uh, go to lfnw.org for Linux Fest Northwest website, and you can find out more information on that. I'll be there. The Pogo Linux folks will be there. It will be an awesome time for all. And, of course, if you go over to lunduke.com, you can find more information about this show, about the, the things I do. You can go to linuxjournal.com and read the articles I write. You can support this show on Patreon, which I do so love. Well, when everybody does that, uh, yeah. And if you want to watch this show on YouTube, you watch this show on YouTube. If you want to watch this show on library, LBRY, you watch this show on library. Go, go to my website. You can see all the different ways to grab the show. Some of those ways, like some of the RSS feeds have not been updated in a couple of weeks. My apologies for that, everybody. It's been a crazy time here in the Lunduk household. We had a new baby come in. My wife had some health problems. Hi, yi, yi. It was. It's been a bit chaotic. But as things are calming down a little bit, some of those RSS feeds and whatnot are going to be restocked and rolling in a little bit more of an automated fashion. But there's still multiple ways that you can grab this show. Uh, and I highly recommend <clears throat> all of them. Whatever works for you. I know some of you love the YouTube. It's fine. Use it. I know some of you love in the library, which is great because it literally downloads a DRM-free MP4 of this show when you grab it via library. Uh, go, go to my website. Go to lunduke.com, and you can find all the information on that. All right. That's it. I am going to head off into the sunset. See you guys tomorrow.